All right, welcome back to the break. Um, today we're going to talk about some more. We're, last time we talked about Leibniz theorem and the Cook Levin theorem. Uh, this time we're going to talk about uh, more understanding the structure of P space. And I don't know what to call this one P space completeness. Um, so, this is just more of a fleshing out of the structure of uh, P space uh, as a class. Recall that we proved that P is a subset of NP, but it's also true that uh, NP is a subset of P space. And I kind of alluded to why, but let me give a more rigorous and more formal um, uh, argument about why that's true. Oh. So um, we have proved previously that P is an NP, and we kind of argued that NP was in P space. But let's, let's more rigorously prove it. And the way we're going to do this is actually using NP completeness. We know that for all L in NP, by the Cook-Levin theorem, that there's a polynomial time reduction from uh, L to sat. So basically, we know that if L is like, L is good and there's bad, uh, we can go to sat and sat complement by this polynomial time reduction of the Cook-Levin theorem, right? So if we can give a polynomial space algorithm for sat, we can also give a polynomial space algorithm for every language in NP. So we can, if we have a polynomial space algorithm for sat, we can combine the polynomial space algorithm with the reduction from L to sat to give a polynomial space algorithm for L. The way it's going to work is you compute the reduction, you, you get the sat, perform the polynomial space algorithm for sat, and then that'll determine in polynomial space whether a string was in L or in L complement. So it's sufficient for us to give a polynomial space algorithm for sat, and then you can say we have a polynomial space algorithm for all of NP by combining the reduction and the uh, polynomial space algorithm. That might not be the best polynomial space algorithm for certain NP-complete problems, but that's fine. It is a polynomial space algorithm. So what is a polynomial space algorithm uh, for uh, sat? We don't care about time, just space here. So we have a CNF formula. What is a polynomial space algorithm for sat? If you try every, that wouldn't work. That would, why not? Because there's, so okay, how many, um, forgot what each term, variable is the Boolean. Yes. So each variable is zero or one. There's two to the n possible assignments. Worst case, you have to try two to the n assignments to see if it's satisfiable. And you right. know it's not satisfiable after you've tried all two to the n. But that's, isn't that, 2 to the n, is, isn't that um, exponential and not polynomial? Ah, exponential time. Oh, a polynomial space. Yes. Oh, right, of course. So how much space, so let's just write it. Let's say brute force search, not brute, BFS, brute uh, force search assignments of phi. So there's n, each assignment is n bits, right? So what happens is, let's say it's the 10th assignment that it ends up being true, or maybe none of them. What you do is you try the first assignment, you try the second assignment, you try the third assignment, and so on, until you find the right assignment. But after you try an assignment, you erase the tape and put the new assignment where it's supposed to be when you're doing your arithmetic. So actually, each assignment takes the same space because they are all overused. So it takes approximately the same space to compute two to the n assignments as it does one assignment. Right. So what is the space complexity for two to the n for one assignment? Constant. Um, that might be too small. Let's say in the number of variable, in the number of variables of n variables, it might take right. n bits to write down the, the actual assignment itself. So we're going to say that this takes space. So sat is spe and specifically sat is in linear space actually. Right. So we have a linear space algorithm for sat. Uh, there might be some log terms and stuff there about the counter 
but that's fine if to the two to the n assignments, which assignment are you on? Doesn't matter because we have a big O here. Great, it's washed away. Um, you could combine this, you can, again, you can combine this polynomial space, linear space, in fact, algorithm for SAT with the polynomial time reduction. And that gives you a polynomial space algorithm for every language in uh, NP. So we can conclude that NP is a subset of P space. The other thing is that this is certainly a, I mentioned this was not the, might not be the best algorithm for every language in NP, polynomial space algorithm. You might be able to just brute force it directly without computing the transformation. And that might look like, uh, like if like three coloring or, or three coloring is um, you can just brute force the colorings as you could brute force the formulas. Knapsack has a dynamic programming polynomial space uh, NP complete. Uh, it's NP complete, but the exponential time algorithm, which uses dynamic programming, uses polynomial space as well, right? So things like this, um, there might be better ways to do specific languages in NP, but just to show the containment, certainly everything in NP, even the things we can't name, has a P space algorithm, right? Um, what does that mean our picture looks like? It looks like this. We have P, we have, P, we have NP, here we have uh, SAT, and like the thousands and thousands of other related NP complete problems that go with SAT. These are the hardest of hard problems in, in NP, and I'm using the right direction to simulate, to, to talk about hardness with respect to the polynomial time reduction, right? And we've just proved that NP is a subset of P space. So P space is here, and there turns out there are something called P space complete problems, which is the point of today. So these are, these are the P space complete problems. Uh, uh, and a P space complete problem, so we can say A is P space complete, If uh, A is in P space, first of all, and uh, for all L in P space, we know that there's a polynomial time reduction from L to P, from L to A, right? So every problem in P space is reducible to A if A is P space complete. And this last condition, of course, is going to be called, guess what? So the, the, a, 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 a is P space complete if it's in P space and this thing. What's the name of just this thing? Just, this is a vocab question rather than a science question. L is in P space. What's the name of that? Yeah, what's it, what's it called if every, uh, every language in P space, there's a polynomial time reduction to A? What's it called if this is true for NP? It's not like P space hard. Or Perfect. Anything. It's called P space hard. Perfect. Yeah, vocab question, right? So this is called being P space hard. And there do exist problems which are NP hard but not in NP. Um, there are, and similarly, there do exist problems which are P space hard and not in P space. Um, so if you have, uh, for example, we were able to prove that if you because there's a polynomial time reduction for every language to sat, if you could put sat in P, that would be sufficient for you to prove that P equals NP, right? So if you could, so sat in some sense is an unelected representative of the entire class of NP with respect to the polynomial time reduction, right? So sat in P implies that um, NP is in P. If you, have a P. if you have a P space complete problem, wherever you can put that P space compl complete problem, it with respect to the polynomial time reduction, it also represents an unelected representative of the entire class of P space. So wherever you put that problem, for example, if you put the P space complete problem in P, polynomial time, then so you can put all of P space in P, and you can resolve a, a, a you could also resolve P versus NP. Why? Well, if, if P is equal to P space, that implies that uh, this collapses, so there's no NP here. So NP is equal to P, right? So P versus P space is as hard of a question than uh, NP versus P, right? Do we know that there, there are problems in P space that are not in NP? 
there are, we don't, we can't separate P from NP. Excuse me, we can't separate NP from P space. Okay. Um, we have really strong evidence and really strong conjectures of that fact. Um, the best things that we have are c uh, classes which represent the same resource. We're able to, and we'll talk about this next time, we're actually able to separate P from XP. We know this. Uh, why? P and XP are both deterministic time complexity classes. The problems really arise when you do translations between resource, okay? P space is about space. P is about time. Like, how can you say I can give this much time for this much space? That's where the things become difficult. Proving something uses more, space, more time than other things is is not as hard. It's not as hard as showing the translation uh, across resource, right? P versus NP is about non-determinism, right? That's what makes it hard. If it was about, like, we can also separate, for example, like time of n squared from. We know this is a strict subset of like time uh, n cubed because those are both the same resource. We can actually perform that separation. We can so some problems require a certain amount of resource. That's a very different result than saying this much resource is equivalent to this much of the different resource or something like this. That's what makes those, those kinds of problems hard. Um, so in fact, when the p-space problem, we're gonna, the goal of today is basically to prove that one problem is p-space complete. Um, and in fact, it's going to be kind of like an obvious generalization of SAT. So it's almost like a mirrored, harder version of what uh, NP-completeness is. Today we're gonna talk about p-space completeness. That was a good question. Any more questions? Let's part. So SAT, recall the structure of SAT. SAT is a Boolean formula, right? It might look like, where's my examples? Um, It might look like uh, it might look like um, x or y or z and w, right? You have a CNF form. You have a, a clause which is a bunch of ors and variables, and then you and the clauses together. Well, this is actually it's, it's a Boolean formula because the variables takes takes on uh, zeros or ones. But we can actually write this as a logical formula, and not the, the distinguishing feature between those isn't really important. But hidden in the front of every SAT formula is the existential quantifiers. There exists x1. There exists x2. Well, x, y. There exists z. There exists w. If you think about it, every SAT formula just has, if it has n variables, it really has n quantifiers in front of it that are all existential. Okay. What happens if we replace these existential quantifiers with other quantifiers, right? We know that there exists, of course, importantly, the universal quantifier, right? What happens if we arbitrarily replace the existential quantifiers with universal ones? We get a generalized problem called a quantified Boolean formula. And again, no real difference between logical formula, Boolean formula, I'm just saying things. But uh, if you have a statement which is kind of like a SAT formula, except you replace, you can have universal quantify, quantification instead of only existential quantification, then you have what's called a quantified Boolean formula. And it makes it obvious immediately that every quantified, every SAT is a special case of a quantified Boolean formula because it's the ones with only the existential quantification instead of general quantification. So for example, consider this quantified Boolean formula. For all x, there exists y such that x or y, and not x or y. This is a uh, quantified, quantified Boolean formula. In general, when you choose the variables, when you choose the assignment of a SAT formula, you can really choose them in any order. However, when you have different quantifications, uh, they don't commute in general. So why is, the, is this a true quantified Boolean formula? Is this statement true? It, it's true if there is a solution for it. For all x, there exists a y. So first, for all x, it's true for if x is 0 or if x is 1. So choose x is 0. If x is 0, then this is 1, then this is on. OK, fine. If x is 0, then there exists a y to make this on. y equals 1. Fine. If x is 1, then this one is on, but this is 0. 
But we can turn this one on by choosing y to be 0, right? So this is true. This, state, this quantified Boolean formula is true, right? It's not, but, they don't, but, the, but the quantifiers do not commute in general. This one is not true. There exists a y for all x, uh, the same thing. This one is not true. There exists a y such that for all x, this is true, OK? Exists a y. Give me, choose one, 1 or 0? 1. 1. That is going to be on. That is going to be off. But then, so now we have to deal with this as being a 0. And it's not true that for all x, this is on, right? If x is 1, then this statement is false. So it's not true for all x, because there's a value of x, there's contradictions, right? Um, the reason I want to mention is that the quantified formula don't uh, translate. As I remember on an exam a long time ago, no one told me this, and I went in and I proved something by mixing, by playing around with quantifications. Because I, obviously I thought they commute. In, well, this is also called pre-next normal form, where you move all the quantifiers to the front. But they can be in between and so on, right? Um, I thought you could permute them, and you can't. And then my algorithm didn't work. So. Uh, no one ever told me that after like three years of discrete math. So I'm just making sure that you, you know that uh, the, the quantifiers in general cannot commute. All right, TQBF is, in, is our generalized analogous, uh, analogy of SAT. This is the language of uh, formulas phi such that phi is a true uh, quantified Boolean formula. So basically, like SAT was a satisfiable CNF, this is a true quantified Boolean formula. So there is, an, there is a selection of the variables, uh, not just the ex existential but, uh, ones, but the universal ones as well, such that the formula is satisfied. Right? So this, I claim, is p-space complete. This is, this is what's going to go uh, to be p-space complete. And we're going to perform uh, a similar proof today to prove that this, this is p-space complete. Before we do, I want to talk about why the reduction is a polynomial time reduction, right? So recall to prove something is in p-space complete, we're going to have to do the following. We're going to prove first that TQBF is in p-space, and we're going to have to give an algorithm for this. So we're going to prove that TQBF is in p-space. Then we're going to have to prove that for all L in p-space, that it's p-space hard, right? So all L in p-space, that L is polynomial time reducible to TQBF. Um, why is this a polynomial time reduction and not a polynomial space reduction, right? That's kind of an interesting question. And the answer is we really want the reduction to be easier than the problem we're trying to solve. We want the translation between problems to be vastly easier than solving the problems themselves. Otherwise, you get some ridiculous ideas. For example, under polynomial time reduction, every problem in P is P-complete. Because you can, you can reduce from any problem to every problem by just the reduction is just solving the problem in polynomial time. So in some sense, when you talk about completeness like within P, you have to use a weaker notion of reduction. Um, so polynomial time reduction, though, is pretty good for anything beyond P, for P, versus P and NP. And it turns out also pretty good for P space. So we want the translation between problems in P space to occur with polynomial time overhead rather than polynomial space overhead. And recall that a polynomial space algorithm, it can use exponential time. As long as it only uses polynomial space, that's fine. That's too strong for us, because then you could solve the problems in P space. We don't want that. We want to be able to translate the problems uh, in a way that's faster than, po than, than possibly solving them. We don't know, again, we don't know if P space equals P, but we don't think so. That's why the reduction is going to be uh, polynomials, uh, polynomial, time, polynomial time reduction. And of course, there's like 100 different variants of reductions, Karp reduction, Cook reduction. 11 reduction. OK, uh, first we need to prove this first part. We're going to prove that TQBF is in P space. Now, the way we're going to do that is just give an algorithm which evaluates the quantifiers in order. And we did one kind of implicitly for SAT, where we did brute force search over the thing. And we kind of implicitly did something with the quantifiers there. But now, we'll, now let's do it like explicitly. So here's the algorithm. And it's, of course, we're, the, 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 the speed up involved for proving that TQBF is in P space 
we're going to perform a similar divide and conquer idea as we did for Savage's theorem. Because the divide and conquer in space here is essential and beautiful and amazing because we get to reuse the space. So we get all this recursion stuff for free, basically. Um, the way we're going to do this is like, let's say, A on input a phi. Phi is going to be a TQBF. And we're going to give it this form. We're going to say Q1, X1, that, 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 Qn, Xn. And we're going to call this like phi of x1, xn, right? So the quantifiers, q1, q1, q2, is just a generic symbol. But they're going to represent a string representing uh, the existential. So like qi is in uh, one of these, right? We just use q because it's a nice, big, bold letter um, for either one of those. Um, and this is just the notation I'm using. We've quantified over x1 to xn. And here in the formula is where you would plug it in, x1 to x1. X, so if you put a 0 there, it's evaluating it, right? So what we're going to do is, again, do a divide-conquer strategy. So we need a base case. So if uh, phi no quantifiers, then it's only made of constants so far. It's been evaluated. So we evaluate. So we evaluate and accept it, we accept and reject appropriately. Uh, now we're going to do a div conquer on the existential and the universal quantifiers. So like, uh, and we're going to go one by one. By the way, if we have a sequence of quantifiers this way, we really have a, 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 a sequence of composed formulas. So like. Uh, Q1, X1, Q2, X2, uh, phi. We write it like this, but this is really Q1, X1, and then something, which happens to be Q2, X2, phi. Right? So what we can do is just go quantifier by quantifier and then recursively pass in this formula as if it's its own formula to whatever we're doing there. Right? So we're going to do if uh, q1 is equal to an existential quantifier, well, what we're going to do is evaluate the expression at 0 or 1 and return true if either of them evaluates to true. So we're going to call this uh, a of q2 dot, 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 oh, excuse me. Uh, Q2, X2, dot, 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 Qn, Xn, evaluated at phi of 0, dot, dot, Xn, right? So that's a recursive call, which evaluates it at 0. And we want to or this with the recursive call for 1, Q2, X2, dot, 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 Qn, xn phi 1 comma xn right so now we're going to return true if either of these are true right so if if it's the first one is existential evaluate it make two recursive calls evaluate it at 0 or 1 and if either of them return true then return true and of course we're going to save the save the evaluations it's a decision pre procedure but we could turn, can turn it into a search thing. But it's going to see, the important part here about, although we're making these crazy looking recursive calls, the space for them is reused. Okay? This one is going to perform whatever it's doing, but then it's going to, only going to return one bit, whether it was true or false. In fact, if it returns one, we're going to skip the second one, right? Uh, but if it's true, then we, when we compute the second call, we reuse the space. So the space is, not, is, is like one additional bit extra. So the fact that we can do the recursive calls is what allows us to reuse the space. That's the case for the existential one. Now, if we do the um, universal quantifier, you could probably guess how this is going to go. Because analogously, while existential quantification is like an or, either one works, universal quantifier requires both to be true. So what we can do is like if q1 is equal to the existential quantifier, 
we can just and them. Q2, X2, dot, dot, dot. Qn, Xn, phi of 0, comma, comma, Xn. And we require both calls to be true. Q2, X2, Qn, Xn, phi. 1. All right. So now if the, if the quantifier was um, a universal, we make two recursive calls, but we require two recursive calls evaluated at 0 or 1, but then we require both to return true for that universal quantifier to be true. All right. So any, there is no question, I think, about the correctness of this algorithm. This correctly will solve... Um, in a little more space efficient way, a brute force search of TQBF, certainly. This is a procedure to, to solve TQBF. But what's important now is what is the space complexity, right? Again, we have a divide conquer algorithm, and it's going to be the size of the recursion depth based on like the stack frame stuff, right? So what is the recursion depth? N. Exactly. At each step, we remove one quantifier. So it's going to be, uh, we'll just call it O of N, but it is N. O of n times the amount that's translated between each stack frame call, which in this case, not in the previous case, but in this case is just a constant, right? So we can say the space used for this uh, algorithm is a constant. So we'll just say, excuse me, the space is O of n, right? So we now have actually a linear space algorithm for uh, TQBF using this very smart, very interesting, almost Savage-like theorem, Savage's theorem kind of thing where he did the, the divide and conquer to save space for TQBF, and this correctly will decide um, TQBF. So because we have a linear space algorithm, we, have now, we can now conclude that TQBF is NP space. Normally, at least for NP-complete reductions, uh, proving the problem is an NP is usually easy, because you can guess. You say, I non-deterministically guess the solution, or the uh, deter deterministic verifier checks it and grades it in this quick strategy. Um, we don't have a logical analog of p-space like we do for, like NP is deterministic verifying. We don't really have a similar analog for p-space. We do for things actually below p-space. We'll talk about that later. But for p-space itself, I'm not aware of anything like that. So coming up with a polynomial space algorithm actually, for a p-space complete problem, actually not trivial usually. This is not a trivial algorithm, I think. Like you couldn't wave your wand about this one. Um, any questions on this one before we can, we can continue with the proof? All right, now we want to prove that for any language in p-space that uh, there's a polynomial time reduction from that language to uh, TQBF. Here, I'll just rewrite it. We want to prove the following. From all L in p-space, uh, then there's a polynomial time reduction from L to TQBF. The way we're going to do this is we're going to create a formula such that if L is in W... If, if, excuse me, ooh. If, if W is an L, then the machine accepts the word W. We want this to be true if and only if some quantified Boolean formula phi will make is going to be in uh, TQBF. Right. So actually, the way we're going to prove this reduction is we're going to combine an idea from Savage's theorem, which we've used for space speed up so far using this divide conquer and uh, an idea from the Cook-Levin theorem. Recall with the Cook-Levin theorem, we were able to sort of use ands and ors to program, quote unquote, a sat CNF formula to look like, uh, to be satisfiable only if the machine accepted W. In some sense, what that did was the formula simulated the machine, kind of, uh, such that the, the formula was satisfiable only if the machine accepted. And we're going to have to mix techniques from both of those things. First off, though, as a bad idea, suppose M is a polynomial space machine, and we just tried to do the Cook-Levin theorem again, OK? We tried to do a tableau, and we went row by row. We checked the first one. We checked the last one. We checked each one follows. We checked the correctness. There's a problem with that, because if we did a tableau of a polynomial space machine, sure, the width of it is going to be polynomial space, right? Because it's going to be polynomial space. But it could be have exponential time. Right, because a polynomial space machine is not bounded in polynomial time like an NP machine is. Um, you are going to 
like possibly have a table that is now exponential size. So creating the table or if creating a formula equivalent to the table is going to also take exponential time. And a polynomial time reduction can't write down a, an exponential sized object. Polynomial time, right? So this, the Cook-Levin idea already is not going to work. Um, we need to be a little more creative. And what we're going to do is actually uh, employ the kind of thing that we did for Savage's theorem. And what that means is like uh, we're going to make uh, phi ci cj t equal 1 if and only if uh, ci, uh, let's say, the p-space machine um, m goes from ci to cj in uh, t steps. Kind of like a, 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 a savage's theorem kind of thing. We're going to make a quantified Boolean formula that, that is true only if M can go from CI to CJ in T steps. And then our final one is going to be uh, phi of C0, CA, uh, and then our space bound. So like if M is a polynomial space machine, if M is P space machine, machine, it uses at most, I could put F of N here, but I'm actually going to just make things uglier and say n to the k space and 2 to the d of n to the k time. Do we agree? If it's a p space machine, there is some k where it uses n to the k space. And then there is a d, so that uses 2 to the d of n to the k time, right? For some d, when we can compute what that d might be. Uh, but then the formula c0, ca, 2 to the d of n to the k is 1 if and only if the machine accepts w. So this, this formula will be the one we want. This is like the entrance, quote unquote, recursion call. We're going to use, we're going to use, basically do uh, like a half Savage's theorem, half Cook Levin theorem to program a true quantified Boolean formula, which is true only if the polynomial space machine uh, accepts, the, accepts w. Okay? Um, so every recursion, every divide conquer algorithm needs a base case, right? So our base case would be like phi. Uh, ci, cj, 1 is true. We want this to be true uh, if and only if. Uh, we'll say this. We'll say this is, maybe I won't say it's true. Maybe I'll say is in tqbf. Uh, if and only if m, a piece, a uh, uh, machine using n to the k space goes from ci yields cj in one step of uh, delta of m or ci equals cj, right? Because it could be zero steps as a base case. Um, how do we know such a formula exists? By the way, I'm asking this as if it's a question in class, but I've given just this as an entire homework question. So I don't know if this is fair. But how do we know such a formula exists? That determines whether QCI CJ1 is in TQBF? Yes. Well, give, how do you know that there is a formula which is true if and only if a machine can go, if CI and CJ are configurations of the machine, you can go from one to the other in one step? So you, you, you want to give a machine that returns true when you go from CI to CJ in one step. How would you give a formula? Let's, let's say I gave you a machine, and I want you to create a formula for me. So we need to create the formula. Oh, OK. I see. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. CNF. Yeah. OK. okay. Um, and you're technically allowed to use universal quantifiers here, but you actually it turns out you don't need to. How would you program a formula, quote unquote, program a formula to be true if the machine, if CI did go to CJ in one step? How much leeway do you have with your variables? Anything you want. The only thing is the reduction has to take polynomial time. 
So it can't take longer than polynomial time to define a base case. I think this is a hard question, but I think it's worth thinking. What if you make a, um, uh, a variable for each configuration? And if one configuration yields another, okay, so instead of a sat, you describe a graph, and then you know that you can later on convert the graph to sat. Ah, um, configuration graph. Right. I see, I see. And then if, if there is a path, so for each configuration is, is a vertex in the graph, and uh -huh. then for each, everything it yields, you draw an edge to the next vertex, and if there is a path from CI to CJ, then you return true. And then from that graph, so that's basically um, trying to find a path, and then you turn that into a CNF. I think you've stumbled, I think, that's not the answer I was looking for, but you've stumbled upon a much deeper idea, which is actually that a lot of books and specifically the Aurora Barak book, try to explain TQBF and Savage's theorem as graph search. You make a graph where each state is a configuration of a machine, and to determine if C0 is reachable to CA, you basically perform a divide and conquer graph search. Um, and that's the way they explain these things. And then, the non and then a deterministic graph, configuration graph, would have outgoing degree one. Non-deterministic would have maybe branches and so on, right? So there's a great idea there. But the answer I was looking for, and that might actually work, if I had, were thinking about it for more than one second. But the answer I'm looking for is the Cook-Levin theorem. Oh, right, I see. So the Cook-Levin theorem will tell you if you can go from the start configuration to an accepting configuration of a table of polynomial size, right? Just take two rows of a table. Oh, that's right. Right, so instead of doing the whole thing again, just do like CI goes here, CJ goes here, you define all the variables, right. and then you um, you know, the start, first one is CI, second one is CJ, then, you know, they follow correctly, and one symbol's in each cell, right? You redo the whole thing, and you get a formula. Not only do you get a, a, C, uh, a CNF formula, you get a SAT formula, and it, excuse me, not only do you get a TQBF formula, you get a SAT formula, and the SAT formulas are TQBF formulas, but you also get a bound on the size of the formula. It's linear sized, because this is now a constant in the depth, but it's n to the k space. So you get a n to the k sized, O of n to the k sized formula. So you get, not only do you get, uh, by the cook levin theorem, do you get that there exists such a formula, but you can get that the size of the formula is also O of n to the k. And this is really, I think, the important application, and I've given this as a problem, as a homework problem, so it's not, obviously we'd come up with this, but the spirit of the cook levin theorem is not that you know how to do all the programming, is that you remember that you did all the programming and that you know you could do it and then you don't do it again. You just think you could do it if you had to. Similar here, I'm not gonna actually spend any time talking about how to build a formula, but I know that I could do it because I did it for the cook levin theorem. So you just have to think that you, the point of the cook levin theorem, to me personally, is that you remember that you did it and then you don't do it again. So you can just say, by the cook levin theorem, I could do this if I wanted to, I'm not going to, but I could. And if I did, there we go. So we've now defined CICJ1 for one step, okay? Now, it is seductive to immediately apply the Savage's theorem induction step. Here's what it might look like. Phi of CI CJ2 would be equal to what? And of course, there's going to be a bunch of variables here that I'm not saying, like CI CJ and two are not the variables. That's hard coded into the thing, but there would be X1s and X10s and whatever, right? This is going to be that there exists C such that phi of C i C one and phi C C J one, right? This is correct, right, for two. What this means is there exists, and by the way, true quantified Boolean formula, there needs to be, the, you're quantifying over um, Booleans, but a configuration is not a Boolean. So what this really is shorthand is for exists, 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 right? So you just kind of encode a polynomial sized object as many quantified Boolean things, right? Um, this would work. It is correct. 
But there is a problem with this. And, and to generalize, so this is the second step, but then we can clearly define C phi of Ci, Cj, T to be recursively phi. Uh, there exists C. Phi of C, I, C, J, T to be that there exists C uh, that does the same thing. So phi of C, I, C, J, C, uh, C, I, C, T over 2 uh, and phi of C, C, J. I should be putting commas here, but I hope it's spaced enough. T over 2, right? There is a problem with this, though. If load is technically correct, do you see what the problem is? Is, is it something to do with just like t over 2? So you could go t over next step t over 4, next step t over 8, next step t over 16, and then eventually you'll get like some infinite. Well, we'll, have to, we'll go to the base case, which we've, we know is a CNF formula. Right? You, that's it, right. It's safe for us to assume that, the, that t is a power of 2. Because if oh, it's not, okay. it's just a product of powers of 2. Okay. Suppose it's a power of 2. Okay? Then when we keep dividing to the base case, this is going to be the base case, whatever this formula is by the Cook-Levin theorem. Right. Um, we keep doing this. But the problem is, although t does divide by 2 each time, the size of the formula multiplies by 2. Oh. Right. So the formula actually gets exponentially bigger right. for each time we recurse down. Uh, and we are trying to perform a polynomial time reduction. We're trying to not do that. Um, and the solution is just kind of a modification of this, it turns out. So notice, though, we still have not used any uh, universal quantifiers. We have a tool. We're trying to prove TQBF is p-space complete. But so far, we've only used existential quantifiers. This can be constructed with only existential quantifiers. It might be actually smaller if you could construct it with universal quantifiers. I don't remember. But... At least we know by the Cook-Levin theorem, because that only used existential quantifiers. You can do this by existential quantification. This is an existential quantifier. So we've only used existential quantifiers for so far. We have a whole tool we can use, universal quantifiers. And the answer is basically uh, the fact that universal quantification, as, we, as the thing I just erased, is kind of like and, when existential quantification is kind of like or. We can convert this and right there to a universal quantification and fold the formula over itself. We can and these two, we can have, a, we can have uh, these two represent the same thing and then replace CIC and CCJ is what we universally quantify over. So I claim that this is going to be equivalent to this. CICJT equals, uh, there exists C, there exists, um, and what am I calling this? I just want to be exact. I call these x, y. And this is one element that we're representing by two things, uh, such that uh, in C, I, C, or C, C, J. So now x, y is a pair of things, but it's either C, I, C, or C, C, J, right? Uh, and these are quantifiers over phi x, y, t over 2. All right. Now, we agreed that the bottom was correct, but it was exponentially sized. Do we agree, at least, that the, this is equivalent to this and then therefore correct? Right? We brought... Oh, oops. No, it's not. Wrong. That's important. It's very important, right? For all x, y in C, I, C, I, C, it has to be true for both, right? Uh, these, these both have to be true for this to be true. So we take the quantifier here as a for all quantifier. For both these, for x, y is C, I, C, or C, C, J. Both of those have to be true, and then we do it this way. Now the formula, though, so this is equivalent to this one, right? Um, it's not standard notation, though, but you can fix this by just some Boolean arithmetic. You can do 
some put some of this inside the formula as well, right? And then you get um, something that's not that's more standard form because you're supposed to quantify over booleans and not whatever this is. But I promise it's fixable. Just it's kind of a data structure thing. Uh, if we agree that these two definitions are equivalent, but this one is smaller, we have basically finished the proof. This one, at each time you divide t by two, you double the size of the formula. How much does this formula increase when you divide t by two for this one? Just by um, by some c. The formula is actually going to encode the size of a configuration, which is going to be the size of the space. So the size, every time we divide the form, what, the, the size to write the, the time, we want to prove that the reduction takes polynomial time. So we need to prove that the, it takes polynomial time to write this down. right? Every time we divide t by 2, we add an amount to the formula. And the amount we add is not a constant, but it's going to be a function of ci and cj, right? which are themselves configurations of a polynomial space machine. So we know that it's going to be log t of the space of the machine, which is the size of a configuration. So we're going to just call that O of n to the k. right? So O of n to the k, at each step, we add O of n to the k to the formula. And we do this log t times. Uh, the first one that we're going to do, though, is going to be 2 to the d of n to the k. So log of 2 to the d of n to the k is going to be none other than O of n to the k. So this is going to be, just I'll write it out to be clear, log of 2 to the d of n to the k, O of n to the k, which is equal to O of n to the k squared, right? Of course, I could repeat this proof and put, instead of anywhere I had n to the k, I could put it f of n, and you would still get a formula of size f of n squared. But it's a polynomial space machine, so I'm going to just say it's n to the k squared. We have now a formula of polynomial size, so the formula doesn't take more than polynomial time to write down. And we've completed the fact that this, the reduction is true. So this, this quantified Boolean formula has a solution, is true, only if the machine accepts w, during this, this interesting folding um, this kind of folding idea. Any questions on this part before we get to um, the last part today? It's kind of fascinating to me how a formula, which is a static object, and a machine, which is a moving object, can be shown to be equivalent in, in some sense because a formula doesn't move. However, the formula can simulate the machine, because, but, the machine but the formula doesn't move. So how can an, a static device simulate a moving object? It's kind of fascinating the way you can encode that um, through, the, through the complicated variables. It's really uh, uh, an, an expressive idea. So consider a SAT formula, right? SAT was like what? It was like uh, exists x, x1, exists x2, exists x3, dot, dot, dot. Let's say exists xn, 5, right? So a SAT formula has all these existential quantifiers in front of it that were hidden from you this whole time. Uh, but now if we look at them, we can kind of think more intuitively about the structure of SAT. When you are solving SAT, you like non-deterministically basically choose the right ones in order to choose the formula. That's why it's NP complete. But if you think about it deterministically, uh, if you think about the process that you solve a SAT formula, you correctly choose x1, you correctly choose x2, you correctly choose x3, and so on, and somehow the formula ends up true. This is really kind of like a puzzle, if you think about it, a single-player puzzle. Uh, what are some puzzles? And it turns out that a lot of puzzles 
end up being NP complete. Uh, with some correct mathematical formulation. These include like Rubik's cubes, uh, Sudoku, 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 Sudoku. Once I learned Sudoku was NP complete, it became less fun immediately because you know that it's as hard as solving a SAT formula. Sudoku, by the way, very NP complete. Why? Um, you prove three coloring is NP complete. And then the same connections that you do between each row, column, and block, you can perform a complete graph there. And then like that is like only n nine colorable, k colorable if the Sudoku puzzle has a solution. So that reduction is kind of interesting. Um, uh, by the way, just before I, I continue with some of these games, these are all finite games, right? A Rubik's cube is finitely many permutations, but you have to take hardness as a function of something. So you do n by n by n Rubik's cubes. Same thing for Sudoku. You do n by n by n. Excuse me, n by n. Um, maybe n squared size puzzles. So it's not nine by nine, uh, but as a function of some n. That's where the hardness has to be a function of something, right? So these are these are NP complete uh, problems I'm listing out. Battleship turns out is NP complete. I would guess this reduction goes to like knapsack, uh, where you overlap things. Minesweeper. All these, proving that all these are NP-complete is kind of cool because you have to figure out how the gadgets work together like a puzzle. Um, and this one was my favorite, was Mario. And I did this last semester in 3510 algorithms. This one, we actually were not able to prove it was NP-complete. We were not able to show Mario was NP, was in NP, but you're able to show that it's NP-hard. Uh, I don't know if you took algorithms with me or not, but um, that's an interesting reduction. There's a guy named Eric Domain who was, who was I don't know, spent a career trying to prove problems are NP. Little puzzles and games are NP complete. Um, so many puzzles are kind of analogous uh, to uh, this intuitive idea of a sequence of quantifications over uh, SAT, like SAT. So like a Rubik's Cube, for example, it's just the sequence of correct moves that you make to go from the puzzle to the uh, identity state, right? Sudoku, you know which you know which positions to put what numbers. Battleship, you know which ones to hit. Um, Mario, you know where to click. Uh, Mario, you know which tunnel to go through. Minesweeper, you know you you know where to click. Um, so these are kind of like SAT. They see, they appear to have the same structure of SAT in the spirit of having this analogous a sequence of universal quantifications. Um, consider the restriction of TQBF. Uh, or like a reformulating of it, where instead of just any general sequence of quantifiers, we require the quantifiers to be alternating. So x, there exists x1, uh, excuse me, for all x1, there exists x2, uh, for all x3, uh, there exists x4. Right, so if, NP-complete problems are like puzzles. P-space-complete problems are like games. And this requires very rigorous proof, but I'm just going to give you a high-level idea. Why is this one like games? Well, a, a universal quantifier is like your opponent's move. An existential quantifier is like your move. Your opponent has to make the move. Then you get to make the move. So for all moves your opponent... Oh. So it's basically like mini-max. For all, for all moves your opponent can make, you make the best move. And then for all moves your opponent can make, then you make the best move and so on. So with some appropriate restrictions, the problems that appear to be P-space complete are not puzzles, or they are some puzzles that are harder, but in fact that are games. And they're games with some restrictions. They're two-player uh, games of perfect information. A game has perfect information if you can see all pieces on the board. Uh, certain games are not perfect information. Like, I don't know when there's like shadowed parts of the map or like Battleship is probably not perfect information on purpose. That's like the whole point of Battleship. Um, but chess is certainly perfect information as a two player. Uh, you know, for all moves your opponent can make, maybe they go first. Then what is your best move? Then for all moves you can make, what is their best move? And so on, right? Um, and analogously, many of these are. Uh, P space complete. What are these? These are going to be, I have a list here. Um, chess, Go, Checkers, and with some restrictions and uh, specializations, right? So these many two-player puzzles are, excuse me, many two-player games 
our uh, piece space complete. Um, I want to give a small remark here about this, though, because, again, chess is a finite game. It's got finitely many pieces, finitely many permutations. There are more chessboard patterns than there are atoms in the universe, right? So you, but there's still finitely many of them, right? So you could encode an entire truth table uh, for every possible chess position and then just create a lookup table for it. And you can actually do that as a DFA, not even a Turing machine. So in some sense, chess has... Uh, is it's not solved, but it is solved, right? So what you do is what you do. You do two things. One to prove chess is p-space complete. You first prove. You first assume that it's generalized chess. You have an n by n board. Um, the next thing you do is you pref is you assume that there's a polynomial bound on the depth of the moves. Um, otherwise, things uh, aren't as good, and I'll, I'll elaborate why. But to give you our map, we have p over here. We have n p. And here we have the NP, and we have NP completeness. These are the games. So these are puzzles, the single player little uh, puzzles. We have P space here. And here we have the two player game. So chess, generalized chess, generalized Go, generalized checkers. And these maybe have some rules restrictions on them, right? Um, I think there's many rules for go. Um, and then we also have, uh, outside of p-space, we have xp time. So this is exponential time, deterministic time algorithms. And it turns out that chess, specifically, unbounded chess, where the chess, you consider a generalized chess as the size of the function of the board, but you don't give a bound, uh, a polynomial bound on the depth of the number of moves, it turns out chess specifically is XP time complete. Others may be, but I recall, I recall chess specifically is XP time complete. Um, that's more realistic because the depth of a game of chess can go on for a really long time, like 80 moves or whatever, right? Uh, and you can go into cycles and repeat things and so on. So it, it, under this intuition where we think like the, thing, the problems in p-space are harder than the problems in NP, to us, what does this mean? This means that games, games are harder than puzzles. And by games, I mean two-player games of perfect information. By puzzles, I mean single-player little doohickey gadget games, right? Um, Mario, uh, Sudoku, and so on. So games appear to be harder than puzzles. Um, is this really true? This relies on a lot of assumptions that p-space is actually algorithmically harder than p. They might both just be exponential time. And I actually, if I recall, and I might not be remembering this right, uh, if you consider the number of quantifiers, I actually think the best algorithm for sat is like 2 to the, two to the n for sat, but the best algorithm for tqbf is like 2 to the 0 0.77 n. Right? So actually, in that sense, TQBF is easier than SAT? I don't remember this exactly. I have to look this up again. But uh, they're both exponential time, of course. But uh, if we ignore the actual practical algorithm stuff, just, just from a pure complexity stuff, we're able to derive uh, the interesting remark that games are harder than puzzles. These, of course, all require proof that they're in a P space complete. But. All right, any questions on, the, on uh, P space completeness on any of the problems we've done? TQBF? Awesome.